Uh, we started in January. We haven't missed a week. And last week was Jim Breslin in the back talking about storytelling, story, what's just a story slam, uh, which is not tech, but it's innovation and communication and internet stuff. Um, next week, Ben, we have... I think it's Craig Schroeder, but I'm going to check because I'm still trying to get the stream up. I think it's um, someone from Robin, Craig Schroeder from Robin Hood yeah. Ventures, yep. is going to talk about venture capital, raising money, and uh, that should be good for anybody starting a startup and who has questions about that. And then after that, uh, I think is Mike Phelan who is a Westchester guy who started Set One, which is a uh, pretty large middleware tech company started out of the University of Delaware with a couple of professors. He just sold a big stake in it to Bain Capital for uh, $400 million, and he's really, uh, uh, I don't know how you describe it, like just a nice, simple guy, and no one told me my tag was sticking out. <laughs> We were afraid what you would say. I thought you were doing a statement. Oh, yeah. It's like a new thing. Yeah, like with the tags on the yeah, statement. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and we're booked out through November, I think. Almost uh, through the year. Um, maybe you have it up once you like. Yep, got it up. Who's, who's after Fink? Uh, Kimberly Fink, <clears throat> treatment box. A uh, cancer survivor who created a, a monthly package arrival kind of box of goodies to help to uh, keep people motivated who are in cancer treatment. So that uh, was a compelling story and that whole business model is on fire you know, on the internet. So that should be pretty compelling. So you can check out longestreetlabs.com events for, for all of the stuff. And we also do another event called Night Owls on Wednesday nights from 7 to 10. And that's, you know, no seats like this, kind of hanging out, talking, sharing projects. Sometimes we do demos of uh, startup, startup apps. So feel free to come to that, that's free. And we're also a co-working space, so people pay uh, $300 a month to uh, be to get a key to this place for 24-7, and um, no contact. We've got to be a good steward, and we have two conference rooms downstairs, and uh, a rumpus room, and we may be moving upstairs. We're growing. We do have a couple of spots. So let me know if you're interested in that. And we also are running an incubator out of Wall Street Labs. And we have two uh, companies in that incubator. And uh, it's really almost pre-early stage. Uh, so folks who have great ideas of the prototype but don't have the means to kind of create a company will take that over. Sponsors. Sponsors. Uh, the good folks at Fox and Rothschild, Fox Rothschild uh, have been helping us for nearly six months uh, figure out what we want to do and how to do it from a legal perspective. So a huge shout out to them. And also to Sean Kaminsky over here, handsome guy with the glasses. That's not me. Uh, he, he is Igniter TV and he's been live streaming this uh, since the and he does all sorts of video production. But uh, our other sponsor, CCEDC, CCEDC, Chester County Economic Development Council, is supporting us financially to be doing that, to be helping this guy and helping the region come across as, like, as good as Philly or as good as Silicon Valley for innovation. Because there's a lot of stories out here that we found uh, that should be told. They're just not being told. And anybody who's been coming regularly probably can agree to kind of how surprising it is what's around here. It's not just human speech. And, and I think that's it. So maybe uh, do we do a brief intro for more? Yeah, okay. Okay. that's sweet. So uh, Mark Hyland comes by way of Mike Lutermoser, who is friends with uh, Waste Oil Recyclers also, who came here and did a presentation. So innovation in my technology, I don't know what verb you guys are in our home, uh, what's the, you know, 
between agriculture and consumer goods. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, and in, in some ways, Modena, this industrial park in Modena, is a little bit of an incubator in itself. There's a couple of different companies on that property, and they're doing all sorts of different things. Um, so uh, it's awesome to have Mark out to talk about organic potting soil. Um, they've been in business eight years. And they recently provided the, the means to, uh, how do you describe it? What is organic potting soil doing? It's a, there's a, a living sculpture outside of 30 Rock in New York. It's a Jeff Koons installation. And it is growing out of organic potatoes. Yeah. And, well, I don't know if you have a picture. Did you bring a presentation? I didn't. Yeah, if you Google Split Rocker and okay. 30 Rock, you know. It's a small company, and I hope to hear kind of the genesis of it and how it's continuing to be innovative and in the future and some kind of uh, tips for being a successful innovator. So, thanks for coming. <laughs>So you guys got the uh, the brief intro there, but uh, so I figured I'd basically come on in and talk a little bit about you know why I started Organic Mechanics uh, eight years ago, a little bit about you know how we do what we do, and a little bit about what we do. Uh, but uh, you know, basically I um, you know I started this company. I was the first employee. Um, I started this company back in 2006, and of course the genesis was far before that. Thinking about it, what would I do after? Graduating from uh, you know the University of Florida and then the University of Delaware, I got my master's at the University of Delaware in the Longwood Graduate Program, uh, which is a partnership between UDEL and Longwood Gardens. So essentially, they're producing leaders in the field of public horticulture. So a lot of my um, students that uh, you know went through the program together, they're at places like um, the New England Wildflower Center up in Massachusetts, or they're down in Florida at the Fairchild National Tropical Garden or they're at Longwood Gardens, or they're at Chanticleer, or they're at you know, all the different gardens that make up uh, the public gardens movement in the US. But uh, I kind of uh, jumped ship out of public gardens. Uh, I thought for a long time, you know, what was I gonna do you know, when I grew up, right? And uh, Potting Soil Company ended up winning, uh, primarily because when I was going to school, uh, you know, this was in the textbooks, that compost will never work as a soil amendment. It's too variable, you just can't use it uh, in production horticulture. Um, so I didn't agree with that. And also at the same time, in all the major horticultural schools, it was all about, um, you know, kind of like the uh, historical mantra, better living through chemicals, which uh, in the gardening world, I would tend to disagree. You know, that I, I'm personally an organic gardener. I think that that works better to be in tune with nature. Your, your crops will harvest and yield um, not only increased yields, but also more nutrient-dense foods. So I started this company to provide a earth-friendly, uh, sustainable option for gardeners. Because no matter what you buy, you're voting with your dollars uh, at the grocery store, at the farmer's market, when you buy your clothes, uh, whatever it is. And so offering this organic option that was based in biology, as opposed to um, the dominant uh, media of the day, which is peat moss. So we're, you know, we're providing an alternative. It's just more sustainable, more earth-friendly. Uh, and, you know, environmental sustainability is a core value at Organic Mechanics. So that kind of guides and shapes everything that we do. So that means that we use biodiesel for our equipment. We're using wind power for our electric. Uh, we take in all the pallets that uh, we receive materials on and we upcycle, repurpose them into our trade show displays for whether it's the Philadelphia Flower Show or the trade shows that we go to to kind of recruit new garden center customers. So, and I really love the, the palette reuse here, really nice. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the, the genesis of the company is that, uh, you know, just grew out of an uh, interest in providing a friendly option for gardeners, because there really wasn't one. Because um, everybody's heard of, you know, Scott's miracle Grow. They've got millions of dollars in ad campaign. I'm sure everyone knows that name, because um, they've been making potting soil for the past 40 years, right? And when I say potting soil, you know, that was our first product. We were a one-trick pony when we started. We had one product, one size, uh, and it was potting soil. So that's the media that you're using to grow plants in containers, whether it's in front of your house, window boxes, 
um, you know, plants in containers, essentially, right? Um, so potting soil, you know, basically our very first product, it didn't look like this at the time, but this is our premium blend potting soil. So this was the very first one that we did. Um, and when we uh, started, you know, this is a, uh, the new look for our company. When we started, three guys designed the bags for organic mechanics. That was a bad idea, <laughs> right? Because the primary buyer at garden centers is uh, female between the ages of 20 and 60, primary buyer that spends the most amount of money in garden centers in the United States. Uh, so we probably should have you know, thought about that a little more. Again, you know, as a startup, you do all your research, you really think you know what you're getting into, and you think you know everything, and then you get into it and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff I didn't know. But you trial by fire, and you learn, and you move on, and you just keep going, right? So we had 30 women on the focus group to design this bag. So artistic elements. Um, uh, a lot of people knock us for having this white bag, but you know, the women on the focus group said, hey, that stands out. Everybody has a colorful bag that kind of blends in when you cross merchandise at a garden center, whereas this really pops when you put it between green plants. It really stands out. Um, so Premium Blend was our very first product. Uh, <clears throat> since then, we've grown. We have about um, 15 SKUs now, uh, SKUs meaning different items. Uh, different sizes, uh, different products from a seed starting blend to we do uh, just pure worm castings now. Um, so we uh, have a lot of different products, right? But um, you know, how we kept going, uh, you know, we were originally um, just me in a warehouse in uh, Downingtown, and we called it the Bat Cave because it was uh, you couldn't see out of it, there were no windows, it was kind of depressing. But uh, over time, we grew because the focus of the company, um, you know, I knew a little bit. I knew, okay, I should work the trade shows. And we did. We started with one trade show, and that got us a little bit of business. Um, but our big break actually came just from, um, you know, as a startup, what we all have to do, which is keep your eyes open, take chances, jump when the time comes, right? I mean, you just got to be ready for it. So I was shopping at a Whole Foods. And I was just, you know, I had too much coffee, so I'm using the bathroom. There's a little eight and a half by 11 flyer on the bulletin board before the bathroom. It says, oh, do you, are you a local producer? Would you like to sell the Whole Foods? If so, you know, email this person. And, you know, there's a local meetup in Lancaster County, and we're looking for producers. And so I did. And took a shot. And they were like, ah, uh, yeah, sure, potting soil? OK, yeah, we'll talk to you, fine. And that one thing led to another. And at first, they gave us just the Philly region stores, which there's, um, there were seven stores at the time. And it did pretty well the first year. So I said, OK, we'll give you, you know, Philly region and the two southern New Jersey stores, because this is the mid-Atlantic, right? And just kept expanding and expanding and expanding over the years. And now we're sold in every Whole Foods in the mid-Atlantic, the Midwest, the Northeast, and the North Atlantic. We're chipping away at them, trying to get them to bring in more products. Uh, we just got Florida as a region. So there's different regions around the country with Whole Foods. So they're currently one of our biggest customers uh, and one of our best customers. Uh, for obvious reasons, the Whole Foods shopper is definitely looking for an organic product. Um, so that is how we kind of grew into that market. And uh, you know, we also sold at a lot of the uh, co-ops. So lots of co-ops in Philly carry us. Uh, we have a distributor that um, basically services that market. Um, but we also got into the garden center world because you know garden centers are primarily where you go to buy your plants and your soil and your fertilizer and your hoses and your pruners and everything else you need to garden. So um, we went big time after the independent garden center market. And by independent, I mean the mom and pops, not the boxes. So we're always going to be with the independents. It's kind of like it's, it's two camps in the horticulture world. Um, you know, going to school for horticulture, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I, I, I have a degree in environmental horticulture. Like, well, what does that even mean? You know, so those are the folks that are producing all the plants that you can buy at the garden centers. Um, but it's a much bigger world than that. So, um, you know, going after the garden centers, I thought it would be a piece of cake. I thought, well, every garden center is going to absolutely want our organic potting soil. Of course, every gardener wants that. Um, and then I found out really quickly, actually, that it was going to take a lot of convincing uh, number one, we were a small company, and we were a young company. And so a lot of stores didn't want to take a chance on us because they were afraid we wouldn't be around in three years or two years or whatever, right? Um, so over time, we've slowly convinced them to come over because they realize we do have staying power. Um, we've gained a, a following in the gardening community. 
uh, which has led to our success as well. But uh, you know, we, we really did that by just hammering down on the trade shows where we were in front of the owners of the garden centers, the buyers at the garden centers. We've done a little bit of consumer work, but not a whole lot. Uh, really, the, the web presence is where we've kind of put all the eggs in that basket in the beginning. We hired a PR company to really get that up and running. So if you, you know, Google search uh, or, or whoever you use, um, organic potting soil, we generally come up in the top three. And currently, I think we're up at the top. So we, we trade spots with Home Depot, with uh, Grow Organic, which is Peaceful Valley Farm Supply out in California. It's a huge company. Um, so, and, uh, you know, Scott's is nowhere to be found. That's good for us. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if you search, so that's, you know, people who are looking for that, they've found us. Uh, you know, we have about 350 or so stores now uh, nationwide, primarily from Philly to D.C. along the 95 corridor. That's our core market. Um, but we do have holdouts in New York, uh, further north, Pittsburgh, Chicago, a um, little holdouts here and there. But... Um, so we make organic mechanics in a uh, warehouse facility out in, as we call it, Mogrina, uh, which Chris was mentioning, is the, um, uh, the industrial complex. So Waste Oil Recyclers is out there. Uh, there's a few other companies. If you've ever eaten at Avalon and those beautiful wooden tables that are there, those are made by the guys at, um, out in Mogrina. So that's a Philly block and board. Um, so there's a few companies that are out there, but that's really where we uh, moved to. I think how we got out of the Bat Cave in Downingtown. And you know we had these uh, friends of ours were moving in to Coatesville, and so they allowed us to move into the facility as well. We've grown over the years. Um, they actually had to buy an additional property so that they could expand, we could expand, and that opened up spaces for other uh, entrepreneurs starting businesses. But um, so we have a facility out there where we blend and bag, so we get in all the raw materials, mix the recipes, bag it up, palletize it, ship it back out. Um, we use some distributors, but mostly it's direct. So going direct, we've cut out the middleman. Um, a lot of people would say that the distribution model is crashing, and not only in our industry, but other industries. Um, Commerce was the biggest distributor for garden products. They were a multi, I mean, they were three digits plus million dollar company, and they folded two years ago because they were working on small margins, just didn't work in today's model. And you kind of see that as you really look uh, strategically ahead as where we're going to be in 10 years. Um, so that's worked out well for us, and we've been fortunate that Going Direct has done that for us. Um, so, I mean, we sell to the garden centers, we sell to the natural food stores, but we have a huge growing contingent of landscape architects, um, landscape designers, and that field is growing due to Philadelphia. We've kind of doubled down in Philly, and we're doing more work there as well. Um, all the containers that are on Broad Street from City Hall down the Avenue of the Arts towards the stadiums, that's all organic mechanics. Uh, all the way around 30th Street Station, uh, the porch at 30th Street, if you've ever been there for a concert or you know, just when you take the train to Philly and you get out and do your thing, that's all organic mechanics around there. Um, as Chris said, we have provided the soil for Split Rocker. It's a huge three-story, 30-foot by 30-foot installation in NYC at 30 Rock. It's a, so it's just all our soil in it, and then annuals planted in it. And uh, so we've done soil for a lot of custom projects like that. Uh, and that's come through essentially getting out there. I mean, when, when I started, I gave talks anywhere and everywhere that I could. I gave about 70 talks a year, anything from a garden club, where there might be anywhere from 10 to 30, usually gardening ladies, not always, but usually. Uh, and then we, you know, I would give talks at the Philly Flower Show. I've given talks at Longwood Gardens, Mount Cuba Center, a lot of the local area nonprofits and public gardens around here. Uh, I used to be on the NBC 10 show a lot as their garden guy expert, and then Comcast bought them out, and things changed. But uh, so uh, wherever and whenever people had an interest in hearing about organic gardening, I would absolutely come and talk. And I would, you know, doing that, I would always keep it to talking about organic gardening, not about hey, it's organic mechanics, hey, you should buy a product, hey, you know, that's, that's not really the focus. It's all about getting people to be organic gardeners, you know, why I started the company, why we should be gardening organically, why that's important to the earth, why that's important to our grandkids, why that's important all around. And just knowing full well, if you do that, then they're going to come full circle and at least check out the website and maybe try a product next time they're at the garden center and slowly but surely we've converted people over to using organic mechanics. I mean, from a gardener's perspective, you know, I said we're a consumer goods company earlier. I hate that word. I hate the word consumer, right? 
because it's all about consumption and me, 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 and that's, um, you know, it's, it's more about we're a garden good company, really. We're for, you know, producing products for gardeners, people that love to get their hands dirty, love to grow their own food, flowers, whatever it is. Um, you know, we have products to make your life easier as a gardener because our products have tons of biology, so that means you're going to water less, it means your plants are going to be healthier, um, or peat moss is the, the number one thing used in potting soils in the industry. All of our soils are peat free. Right? So we've used compost and coconut fiber and other ingredients to replace the peat. Um, we've also, you know, that, that statement, the environmental sustainability is a core value at Organic Mechanics, goes through everything. So when alternative ingredients come up, we take a look at them. We do R&D, can we use this product to replace something else that lowers our carbon footprint as a whole? A good example of that is uh, perlite is in a lot of potting soils. It's the white stuff you see in the potting soil, right? You squish it with your fingers, it's crunchy. That way you know it's actual perlite. Perlite is silica ore. It's mined out of the ground in the southwest or over in Africa. It then has to be heated up to over 1,400 degrees three different times in its production process. So very energy intensive to make perlite, right? So we began looking at, and now we use rice hulls instead of perlite, so rice hulls are the shell around the rice. Uh, you use that in place of perlite, you can actually use less of it to get the same porosity, the same aeration that makes a mix fluffy so roots can pass right through it. Uh, so we use rice hulls in a lot of our mixes. Uh, the only one we still use perlite in is the premium blend. That's because it was the original blend. When we did the focus groups, I showed a lot of different soils and the gardening lady said, well, where's the white stuff? So we, we, we put it in, the premium blend, because that's traditionally what everyone's used to, and that's okay. Um, so that's kind of like our, that was our original gateway soil to bring them into the full line. Um, and you know it's a cheap potting soil when you try to squish it and it bounces back. That means it's a styrofoam pellet. So the really cheap soils, we'll put that in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean that, uh, so we use rice hulls in the container blend. Uh, we use it in the seed starting blend. We actually launched a pure rice hull product this year for the first time. We're the first company in the U.S. to launch a retail-ready pure rice hull for use in your garden. So you can use that to amend soil, to lighten up a clay uh, bed. Uh, you can use it as a perlite replacement in your potting soil. You can use it as a weed deterrent on the surface of your containers if you have pots, can, uh, plants in pots. Um, so Monrovia is one of the biggest nurseries in the U.S. They're doing that. That reduces their need to spray Roundup. Because if you think about it, you have acres and acres and acres of containers, and you have to spray Roundup on all those containers so that the weeds don't grow, or pre-emergent herbicides. There's a lot of chemicals used. So you use rice hulls. It's a barrier. It's a weed blocker. So it's a more sustainable way to go. You can use it also as a fungus gnat deterrent for your house plants. If you've ever had those little annoying fungus gnats flying around your house plants, that means that the soil is generally too wet. And so this creates a nice barrier, kind of blocks them. So a few different uses for pure rice hulls. So we did that. Another new product that we launched this year, it's our root zone feeder packs. We call it Forget About It because it's so incredibly easy to use. Plus we have the whole like Philly reference, even though Philly has kind of like the least claim. Northern Jersey and Brooklyn definitely have the most claim, hands down. But we did a little borrowing uh, and called it Forget About It because it is so easy. Because you take one feeder pack, you put it underneath the plant at planting time, right next to the root ball when you plant. And that's because it has mycorrhizal fungi in it. Uh, if you don't know mycorrhizal fungi, so they're beneficial microbes that live in the soil. They form a symbiotic association with plant roots that allows the plant to take up more nutrients, more water in times of drought, in times of stress. So the plant is going to be healthier than if you didn't have that. But it not only has the mycorrhizae, it has a 422 fertilizer. So that's enough to get your plants up and going. It has biochar in there which biochar is a yield booster in the garden. Tons of new work on biochar. Um, biochar is an ancient technology that comes from the Amazon, it's terra preta. Uh, but basically biochar acts like a sponge. It absorbs water, nutrients, and biology in the soil, and then releases it back to the plants when it's needed in times of stress. Uh, so the biochar and the mycorrhizae are your yield boosters. You got a fertilizer in there. Then you also have azomite and oyster shell flour. Uh, those are trace mineral providers, so plants need a lot of the, the macronutrients, the big stuff, the N, the P, and the K, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but they need a lot of micronutrients too. So we added those in there to be the complete package, so you don't have to buy six different packages of things and mix a little bit of this and a little bit of that, because everyone always wonders, am I putting in the right amount? Too much? Too little? So we made it easy, 
so that you can just forget about it and garden mm -hmm. organically, um, you know, without worrying about it. So when we look at launching new products, it's all about does it fit n another niche in the industry? Is it something that no one else is doing? Uh, is it something that builds on the success of our current line? And so that's how we've added, you know, we have a mulch product now. I never thought we'd be doing mulch. Mulch is a commodity item, but Whole Foods asked us to do it, and it's actually selling very well. It's for the families uh, or people with pets that are like, everything in my garden must be organic. Because when you buy dyed black mulch, you have no idea what's in that. That could be ground up uh, construction debris, ground up pallets, who knows what. Um, and so if that's important to you, well, you know, we have a product for you now for that mulch. Um, and we'll continue to add more products. I always said we don't want to do like a rose soil and a African violet soil and all those typical soils that you can find in the, in the garden center world. Uh, and I don't think we'll ever get there, but you know, next year we're talking about a cacti and succulent soil because succulents are huge right now. Um, so that's probably like our new product for next year. So you know, we do add things, but it's very judicious and only after we're sure that that's gonna be a right fit for our company. Um, so that's a little bit about you know, what we do as well. How am I doing on time, Chris? Or whoever's keeping track. Five more minutes and we'll do Q&A. Sounds good. Um, so I did a little bit about why and uh, how what we do what we do and what. So, you know, really, you know, started this company to provide an earth-friendly alternative by making potting soils and soil amendments that are 100% organic to the core uh, so that gardeners have an easier time of not only growing beautiful plants, uh, but knowing that they are contributing to a more sustainable environment. Uh, and and uh, one of those things that's very important to us is this uh, OMRI listed logo. So when you go to the store and you buy organic milk, apples, whatever it is, you, there's that USDA stamp on there, right? You're probably familiar with seeing that. Uh, this is the stamp for gardening products. If a gardening product has this OMRI listed seal on it, the stamp, you know, number one, an organic farmer could use it on his certified organic farm, no problem. So this is a third-party verifi verification system. Uh, they're a nonprofit based in Oregon, but they look at every single detail of your operation, the ingredients in your products, and then they'll, they'll sign off and they'll say, okay, yes, this product can now be OMRI listed. Uh, so most of our products are OMRI listed. It's a, it's a time and money thing to get them OMRI listed, so we're in the process of listing uh, other products as well. But when you see that OMRI listing on a product, and that's on everything from potting soils to fertilizer, pest control, you name it, if it has that symbol on there, you know it's organic, right? And so we kind of took that extra step. You know, not only are our products organic, we know they are, and they're peat-free, uh, which is being very earth-friendly, uh, but the OMRI listing is huge in the uh, organic gardening community. Uh, so we went ahead and did that for, for most of our products, and we'll continue to do that with our product line as we launch different items. So I can probably just keep going with more and more detail, but um, I'm happy to go back to other things if you all want to go ahead to start some Q&A. I'd like to throw out one question before Michael jumps in there. And the rule is you got to introduce yourself really quickly uh, before you ask your question. You mentioned up front that you guys designed a bag and that was bad. How, can you quantify how bad it was? Do you think you missed something big or was it just small? If you had done it this way from the beginning, would things have been this different or this different? So that's a great question. No one's actually ever asked me that. Um, hard to say uh, if we kind of missed a mark in the beginning by going that route. Um, you know, I guess we'll, we'll never know. But uh, certainly um, we know for a fact that at the trade shows, I mean, women say, oh, this is a very nice looking bag. I really like your bag. It looks so different than everything else. Uh, whereas that first bag, everybody hated it. Um, and also the supplier, I mean, we went through a lot to learn how to produce a bag or actually have a bag produced for us that will stand up to the elements, the sun, the rain, et cetera. Those first bags just split open after about six months of being out in the, in the sun. And that's really bad at the garden center. Uh, so now we know, I mean, the, the ink, this is uh, UV uh, protected inks and the bag itself has UV. So. You know, did we miss some sales in the beginning? Uh, I would say, yeah. I mean, would we have ramped up faster if we had a better looking uh, bag? I would say absolutely. We probably would have ramped up faster. Okay. Yes, this is Mike Duncan. Um, as 
aside from the people that you mentioned in the uh, Mo, Mo, Mo Green. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, we call it Mogrina just because the town is Modena, PA, yeah, right. Yeah. right? And so the green aspect of our companies. Um, so strategic partnerships. Um, you know, we've had. Uh, I would say that Whole Foods has been a strategic partnership for us. Um, you know, we consider ourselves partners uh, with them to develop new products as well as service the stores and their end customers. Um, but we have also partnered up with uh, providing fulfillment for a like-minded company. Um, I mentioned biochar earlier, so we do all the fulfillment for a company called Soil Reef Biochar. Uh, they're local, they were started in Berwyn, um, and basically we do all the fulfillment for them. We do blending and bagging and um, help them with uh, R&D as well at our facility. Uh, so th there have been a couple, I would say. Um, you know, we're always looking for the strategic partnerships to, to build our, our brand. Um, you know, Terrain and Urban Outfitters has been one of those as well. They really embraced us uh, as a product and, and uh, uh, as a vendor, essentially. And we've done a lot of work with them, too. And I have one other question. Um, scalability. So what, what have you found to be the biggest issues you've had in scalability? The scalability, the biggest issue we've had is quality control. You know, quality control is number one, I and mean, that has to be paramount to everything that we do as a startup. Because uh, the example that I would give is that um, you know we were growing, and we uh, essentially tried to farm out some production to the Chicago land area, so it would be a locally produced product to Chicago. It fit the business model. It fit that environmental sustainability as a core value fit. But in the end, the company that we uh, subcontracted to, they're a major company. They're huge, doing you know, multi-millions a year. But they didn't have the quality control that we have. And they lost us business out there. They lost us customers, key customers, that we're going to have to work for years to get back. And when you do that and you lose that, you lose that face, you know, it's hard to get it back. So yeah, uh, quality control for us has been key in scaling. Who detected the, the miss in quality? Was it the consumer or the testing um, radio? It was uh, essentially a combination of distributor, consumer, and me personally based on interacting with them. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilson Chu, I'm here representing the score. It's a resource for the small business. And so, Mark, when you first started out, Yeah, so that's a great question about uh, you know whether or not there was competition in the same space that we were in. When we when I started this company in 2006, you know in 2004 is when sustainability and green was on the front cover of Time and whatnot. So you you knew it was coming. I mean the wave was already coming on shore, but uh, at the time at the trade shows there was only about four organic potting soil companies out there. And you know these trade shows have thousands of vendors, right? So there's about four organic potting soil companies. None that were Omri listed. None that were peat free. So we completely differentiated. We were the only Omri. We were the first Omri listed peat free organic potting soil company out there. Um, now there are more than a dozen organic potting soil companies at these same shows that we go to, um, but uh, none of them still have the same. Um, kind of genesis and clarity, uh, transparency that we do as a company, at least we feel. Um, you know, we're still the only OMRI listed, peat free, biology based soil out there. Um, and then, you know, if you look at our website, I mean, we're small, and I, you know, it's the story of the organic mechanic. There's a reason why the marketing company puts my mug on the home page and on the catalog. And, you know, it's, I started this company after going to the University of Florida for environmental. I mean, your story as a startup is huge to future customers and the way people will buy into your business, right? They want to hear your story. People just wanted to hear the organic mechanics story. So that has really helped a lot to keep us uh, kind of at the forefront, you know, really um, telling your story and telling it well. Um, 
you know, because no one has the same track that we do in, in this field. It's kind of, they're, they're just going into it for the money kind of thing. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so humanure is, uh, if you don't know, it's essentially human manure, which is then uh, composted either in a composting toilet or otherwise, um, biosolids. Have you ever seen the product Malorganite? Uh, that's a product that's made from, from biosolids, from human waste. So, um, you know, the uh, short story is that uh, I think landfilling it is horrible. I think something should be done with it. I mean, you look at other cultures around the world, they've been using this fertilizer for a long time. Uh, however, I think that um, in the United States, we have an obsession with uh, taking pills, and uh, there is so much estrogen in that now. And just to pick one, one thing, right? I mean, you look at what's going on in, this, in the uh, Susquehanna River uh, with the bass there. I mean, you can Google that and see what's going on. It's a direct result of the estrogen in the water that's running off. Um, so there's some issues, but you know, if it's composted correctly, meaning it hits all the scientific uh, you know, mm. uh, definition of composting. And then absolutely you can use it on um, fields and ornamental landscapes where there's not going to be kids playing. Um, sure, I think we should absolutely use it as a fertilizer. It's a resource. We should be using it. Can you uh, restate your bio? Because there's more to it. It's pretty <laughs> serious organic. I, well, I taught organic gardening at West Ham School for mm. a dozen years or so, but big thing is I'm doing uh, agroecology in Mexico and Nicaragua with low-income families. Mm. It's, you know, it's really about food security. It's about uh, people making it through what's coming. Absolutely. And I agree that, you know, you got to use what you have and it's um, whatever. It's the same thing like uh, we would learn with worm castings. It's whatever you put in, you're going to get out of the same. I mean, that's everywhere in life. But yeah, if there wasn't all this estrogen in it, then it'd probably be a lot better. Uh, Jim Lautner with iComet and iTag out of Chester County Economic Development Council. Uh, Three-tiered question, but all related. When you talked about expanding to new markets, your product is not light. So in terms of getting product to market and handling that expense, are you now creating product in multiple sites? You mentioned Chicago not working out. So how many locations are creating product? And as you're growing, are, do you have a need to go find Field sources, et cetera, to be able to create new product? Yeah, so it's a great question. We currently are doing all production in Pennsylvania. We pulled it back to PA after we had the quality control issues in the Chicago area. That's not to say that we wouldn't be open to a partner in other areas. Uh, that's going to require <coughs> reaching a certain threshold of business before we go down that road, road again to make sure that it's already uh, the demand is there. Um, we are very fortunate that. In Modena at the Mogrina Industrial Complex, Waste Oil Recyclers just received a grant for a rail spur development. We're right along, uh, I forget the name of the exact name of the railway, but it's the same railway that goes up to Coatesville where Lukens is tearing down and recycling all that steel. It goes right past us. So we have the now long term ability to load containers of soil, shipment by rail. If you don't know, shipping by rail is the most efficient means of shipping in the country. You can ship a ton of freight 500 miles on one gallon of diesel fuel uh, versus a tractor trailer, which is typical for potting soils. We load tractor trailers all day long. You know, those are getting 12 miles to the gallon. So uh, for us, the long term is definitely rail and rail transport as we, as we continue, as you know, fuel prices continue to rise. So in the short term, that's where we're going. But in the long term, as demand ramps up, yeah, absolutely, we're going to be open to other partners. All right, five more minutes. Uh, um, Kyle Hudson, 23 North Digital. So when did you know, like you're, you see this product blowing up, when did you know to make the next product? Like how did you know to expand from just one thing you got that nail? When do you know to go to the next step? And, wh and what's that decision process like? For sure you had five different things you wanted to make. How did you choose now's the time and what's what? So we... In regards to launching new products, it's all about uh, you know, market research and knowing what the trends are and letting that somewhat guide your decision making or at least your research process. So for us, uh, it was a, we also listened to our customers and heard, heard their, all their feedback and what they said. So the premium blend was great for a lot of settings, but for some plants, some settings, people felt, well, it holds a little too much moisture. 
So we developed a container blend in response to that. This one's more well-drained. It's our all-purpose outdoor potting soil. You could water it every day, rain every day, it's fine, right? So listening to the customers and expanding that way, but then also knowing the market. You know, the grow-your-own food movement got huge in the last few years with the rise of celebrity chefs on the Food Network and whatnot. So, you know, home gardening, raised bed gardening, that's really big right now. So the, the planting mix compost blend, uh, rode those coattails. The seed starting blend, people wanted to start their own seeds at home. Uh, mom's gardening with kids, you know, dad's gardening with kids. Um, so that continues to guide it. And then um, we'll do new sizes of products, when, uh, again, from customer feedback. Hey, we'd love it if you had a larger size, smaller size. We have to hear that over and over and over again, and from a number of customers before we'll do it. You know, really, you have to be a mega giant like Whole Foods to say, we'd really like a mulch for us to listen and be like, okay, we'll make a mulch then, right? So that's, again, listening to your customers. But it really, it's all about the market demands and watching the trends and listening to your customers. But did Whole Foods kick you in the shins and make you drop your price? How, how are, what was the pricing dynamic uh, once Whole Foods got into your... Uh, when, when we first started, um, they were just happy to support such a small local business, and they still are. I mean, we fit their core values as well. Um, but as time goes on, we've gotten older. I mean, they are in business to be in business as well, and we can't fault them for that. So, yeah, there's been, um, you know, well, you know, we, we can't sell it for that kind of thing, you know, with uh, a new product. Well, this is what we're, we're looking, you know, because it's also market research, because we'll ask our retailers, be like, do you think this product would sell at this price point? What do you think? You know, and if they say yes, no, if, they, if we hear a lot of no's, we're like, okay, we'll, 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 we'll relook at that. But the bottom line is we have to make what we have to make to survive and keep going. And when you look at our products in, uh, at retail, our products are between 10 and 20% higher than everybody else's products. And it depends on where you are. If you're shopping outside of New York City, yes, it's going to be 20% higher. But let's, let's look at everything up there. Gas is four bucks a gallon, not 350. I mean, you know, come on, it's, it's kind of apples to apples. You know, if you go to Ace Hardware here in Westchester down the street, we're about 10% more than the average product. But, you know, the, um, the benefits come from, I mean, number one, all the things that I already talked about that we are, that they, the others aren't. And there's, there's those benefits. Um, but also, peat moss breaks down really fast in potting soil. I mean, you pretty much, you have to be an expert gardener to reuse that over and over again or know what you're doing when you repurpose that soil. Our soils will last longer. Um, just because they have more stable, mature ingredients in them, so they just don't break down as fast. So you can reuse it more than one time. So in that sense, it's actually cheaper than conventional potting soils. But, um, and that's, again, kind of knowing your market and then really pitching the selling points and knowing your customer. So not all customers listen to the same selling points. In the Midwest, that reusability thing, using it more than once, that's huge out there because they're very values-driven. Here on the East Coast, people are really in tune with the organic, Earth friendly, that aspects of the company. The local aspects pretty much go everywhere. Local's huge around here. Um, it's starting to gain momentum in the Midwest, but it's not as big as it is here from New York to DC. Hey, go ahead. Uh, my company again is Long Street Labs. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? So. Uh, where I see myself in 10 years with this company, um, I would honestly hope that I get relegated to R&D and someone who is smarter than me becomes the president of the company, that's fine with me, okay? I'm okay with that. You know, we hired a guy who's a VP in marketing. He's, his uh, degree is in uh, marketing and consumer goods. So he's helping to help chart that course. I mean, my experience is with uh, potting soil, soils, horticulture. I got a lot of business sense from my grandfather, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I know there's other people that could probably do this job better than me. At some point, I'm fine just being the R&D guy and then maybe eventually getting phased out. And I would love to go back to public horticulture even. But, I mean, I started this company to put my kids through college, and I hadn't even had any kids yet. So, <laughs> so that's what we're thinking. And, and, where do you, and where do you see the company in 10 years? In 10 years, I would see that uh, we may outgrow Mogrina in 10 years. Hard to say. Um, you know, if... Uh, other people move on and we're able to take over more territory in the warehouse, then maybe we will still be there. But I would say that we definitely will have at least one other, if not two other satellite facilities at that point in 10 years from now, because the demand will be so high we'll have to, because um, that also would allow us to stay in Mogrina 
Um, but we're already upgrading equipment again. You know, it's a constant upgrade process. And uh, 10 years from now, we'll probably have to upgrade what we're already upgrading now, um, which I'd love to be able to think 10 years out and be like, let's plan for that. Uh, but it's also capital and dollars, and you got to do what you can do now. And then, you know, hey, if you have to upgrade again in 10 years, so be it. Is there any related line of business that you might be moving into? Uh, a new line of business, perhaps? A related oh. line of business that you might be moving into? Uh, for us, the original business plan uh, is kind of written that we're going to do potting soils and soil amendments and fertilizers. So that aspect of uh, the company is currently where we're focused. That's not to say we wouldn't do something in the future if a business opportunity presented itself and it kind of matched what we were doing. We've talked about, oh, maybe we should be making raised beds for vegetable gardens and people could buy a raised bed kit from us. We've looked at that a little bit. The economics are kind of shaky. Um, but there's always a chance, and we're up for everything. You know, as, a, as an innovator, as a, you know, as still a young company, whatever's going to make us grow and service our customers better, but yet still go back to the why we exist, which is to provide earth-friendly options for gardeners, it has to go back to that. But if it does and it meets all of those criteria, then yeah, we're open to it. All right, last question. Yeah, uh, Chad Wingrave of Coworld here. Um, you've spoken a lot about knowing your customer and researching your customer. Uh, as you grow, it seems like you have more of ability to actually impact your customer and, and work with them. Is there anything you're doing to try and educate your customer to try and and, and work with your customer, kind of give them new ideas or feed them in new directions that you, your company's values are? Are you at that stage yet? Maybe that's 10 years out. I would say that we're at that stage now. Uh, we try to do that a little bit with the videos that are on our website. There's a whole suite of videos that we have there. We're constantly trying to do more of those. Um, and then also through things like uh, two years ago was our first exhibit at the Philadelphia Flower Show. And that has allowed interaction with tens of thousands of, of people over the past two years. And we're doing it again for 2015. So, and uh, you know, talking at uh, things like the Philly Flower Show, you know, interacting with hundreds of people at a time. And we'll always try to do that to continue to interface with our customers so that we can get direct feedback from gardeners. Because it is, it's really important to continue that throughout your business model and growth, at least in my opinion. All right, let's give a round of applause. Thanks for coming.